Thank you, Sasha and the worship team. Um, tina koto, tina koto, tina tato kato, uh, kia ora e te whanau, ko Caroline Takawingua, um, ko Stretton Takawhano. Good morning, church family. My name's Caroline Stretton, and it's my privilege to lead us in our pastoral prayer and our reading today. So as we have heard, today is the 2nd of April Sunday, uh, and it's Palm Sunday. And today, Christians all over the world are celebrating Christ's victorious and triumphal entry um, into Jerusalem and the start of our Holy Week. Uh, and so I've drawn from Lectio 365 for this prayer today. Uh, kia inoitato, let us pray. As we enter prayer now, we pause to be still, to breathe slowly, to Recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. Jesus, we welcome you into our lives afresh and our time together. Today, we choose to rejoice with all of God's people with the ancient declaration uh, of Psalm 118 Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. So, Father, on this Palm Sunday, we remember the cry of the people when they welcomed Jesus, Hosanna, Lord, save us. And we remember your example, the King sitting humbly on a colt, a donkey. Lord, give us opportunities to practice humility like you, to serve, to listen, to prefer others this Holy Week. Father, as your church gathers today around the world, we join the crowds in Jerusalem and cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us, from being inwardly focused, propel us out to tell the story of your love this Easter. Jesus, we pray on behalf of our friends and family members that don't know you. We say, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Make yourself known to each of them this week. Father, we thank you for this initiative from Ricky and his team and the wonderful resources in the Hope Project as we walk the streets of our neighbourhood, as we talk with our friends and family and workmates, we ask for divine opportunities to point others to you, Lord Jesus. And we pray that these conversations would reap much fruit for your kingdom. Build your kingdom, we pray. Help us to proclaim you this Easter in all we do and all we say. Father, we thank you for the wonderful prayer night on Wednesday when we gather to pray for Easter camp. I thank you for Nicola, for her creative and faithful leadership amongst us, and the great turnout. I thank you for this wonderful faith community that we're part of. Lord, we continue to lift Easter camp to you and our leaders and young people and pray for your blessing, your favour, your provision for every need. Lord, our desire is that uh, our young people, our young adults, would have a faith that is strong, personal and immovable. And we ask that you do more than we can ask or imagine this Easter. We pray for each one of our young people that know you and those that don't yet know you and those who can't make it to camp, that they will have a personal, transformative encounter with you. Lord, we thank you for the good work you're doing in our youth, the new thing that is springing up, the new people who are coming along. We thank you for those that have prayed faithfully for our young people and our young adults, and we ask you to continue to multiply your good work in this space. Lord, we take a moment to stop and be thankful for this new season that we are in. After three years of COVID, we are grateful for opportunities to gather together freely, for the students returning to campus, for even the traffic and its craziness, the sense of being normal again. Help us, Lord, to see and seize these new opportunities that you are giving us to serve you and our families, our workplaces, and our community in this new season. 
Lord, we ask that your glory would be seen in this church, in your church. Father, we ask that our congregation here at NBC and in this nation will be restored as a house of prayer for all the nations. And I thank you for the people from many nations that you've been drawing to us in these last months. May each one feel welcome and loved. Father, may we be a people that fulfil the great commandment to love one another. Our heart aches for those who are struggling through ill health and other concerns. We think particularly of the Kuzel family today and little Damien in hospital. We thank you that Anna can come and be with the family and we pray that although he may have turned a corner, we pray for a divine provision in every way for that family, for financial, spiritual, relational and physical healing. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, we take a moment to name others before you we know that need your healing hand. Father, we ask that we'd be a people that fulfil your great commission, that we would make disciples as we go. Help us to do this in all fears of our life, parents, as parents, as friends, and in all our ministries. May we be a people who build lifelong, faithful, divided followers of you through our ministries. Lord, we lift to you the planning of Kids Club and Protein. We pray for your blessing and favour that you'll be drawing leaders and young people to come to this, uh, these programs and children when they get underway. May we be a church, Lord, who's faithful to your word and relevant in addressing the needs of the people. We pray for our leaders, Marcus and Jenny, Nicola, Ricky, Judy Ann, and the elders. May they clearly hear your leading and guiding. Bless them and encourage them, we pray. Spirit of the living God, on this Palm Sunday, we lift the leaders of our nation and we pray, Hosanna, Lord, save them. Draw them closer to you, Lord Jesus. May their leadership be characterised by wisdom and humility. And as we close our prayer together, we return to Psalm 118. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You are our God and we will give you thanks. You are our God and we will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. So our next task is to um, my next task is to bring to you the reading for today from Matthew 21. And um, I thank you, Elise, for giving me a bit of a tip about how to say <laughs> say it correctly. So, uh, reading from Matthew 21, 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds then went ahead, that went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May the Lord bless to us this reading from his word. The next day, the great crowd that had gathered heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This crowd praised him. They celebrated his miracles and with great expectation told everyone about him. But they did not know him. 
They were waiting for someone who would rule with strength and might, but he came as a humble servant. They wanted him to finally bring their people glory, but he wanted to change them so their lives would bring God glory. They were expecting a general who would crush their enemies, but he came saying, love your enemies. They thought he could offer them deliverance from their oppressors, but he came offering deliverance from sin. This crowd would soon realize that Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted, and they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. So as they yelled, crucify, Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus answered, I am not that kind of king. His kingdom isn't what you see here. It won't be established by chaos and war. His kingdom is in our hearts. His kingdom is truth. His kingdom is goodness. His kingdom is righteousness. He is the humble king, the king of healing, the king of forgiveness, the king of love today. We lift our voices, we cry, Hosanna, save us. Save us from our sin, come dwell in our hearts. Hosanna, we worship you, Jesus Christ, our King. Often when people describe what life is like, they depict it in the same kind of way, that of a path or a road. People say that life is a journey, a voyage from one experience to the next. When we look at the scriptures, we even see that Jesus used this type of imagery. He spoke of the need to travel through life by the narrow road. In other words, a way of life that most ignore, a way that doesn't embrace the world that we are to be in it, but not of it. The narrow road is the way of the cross, and traveling it promises a life that is full and abundant and plentiful, both now and into eternity. It's a life that is connected to the creator of all things, a life that flows with the goodness and blessing of God a life that is empowered by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, a life walking in union with Christ. It is a life that recognizes it is saved from sin. It is a life where the plans and purposes of God are being revealed. The narrow road is living life in a Christ-centered, Christ-focused way. Today is a special day, as we've said, in the Christian calendar because it is a day that we remember another journey, another road, that our Lord and Savior needed to travel. A road that would eventually lead to his pain and suffering and ultimately his death, but a road that also leads to his resurrection and to our salvation. And it is a road that he invites us to walk on with him. For those first disciples whom Jesus had chosen, the road that they found themselves on that first Palm Sunday was familiar. It was the road to Jerusalem, and they had walked it many times before. As they reached the outskirts of the city, or, or sorry, of the town of Bethage, or Bethagy, the city of Jerusalem would have loomed up in sight. The disciples knew that the city would be swelling with it, probably millions of people at that time because the Passover celebration was fast approaching. Jesus knew this road as well. He too had traveled it many times before. His parents, Mary and Joseph, would have, brought him to, uh, would have brought him to Jerusalem for the various feasts and celebrations that took place every year. For all pilgrims, all travelers, this was a magnificent road. Having journeyed for days and days to reach this place and then seeing it, seeing the city of Jerusalem rise up before you would have been an absolutely breathtaking sight. The temple of God would be shimmering in the sunlight. And you would see the towering gates and the vast walls. You would have heard the distant sounds of people being about their business, as well as those who were preparing for worship. 
If you were a Hebrew, this great city, the history of this great city would have come flooding into your mind. You'll recall the stories of how King David took the land as God's city and how King Solomon built the first glorious temple there. Then you recall the years of sorrow when it lay in ruin until Nehemiah came to rebuild the city walls. The road to Jerusalem was known and well loved. But the journey on that very first Palm Sunday was different. The road would not change, but the things along the way, and ultimately the end result would be different to any trip that had ever been made to Jerusalem before. On that particular day, a prophecy of the coming Messiah was fulfilled. Scripture tells us that Jesus entered Jerusalem by riding on a donkey's colt, a sign of the coming King of Peace. On that day, crowds of people lined the road, crying out, Hosanna, which means save us, deliver us. Many called out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, this road was familiar, and the road did not change, but this particular journey was unique. The disciples knew this road, but Jesus knew the journey. He knew what lay ahead of him but he still went on. That day, the crowds were shouting Hosanna, but by the end of the week, they were calling out, crucify him. On that day, we read of branches and of cloaks being laid out before him as a sign of praise. But by what is now known as Good Friday, people followed him, many in tears, his blood and sweat dripping as he toiled under the carrying of a cross. Jesus knew the journey, but he still went forward. On that first Palm Sunday, the people attributed Jesus titles that reflected their belief or their understanding of him. They called him the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They knew that this Jesus was a bringer of change. They believed that he had come as the promised deliverer of the people. Now their thoughts of deliverance were based on their own understanding. The Romans, a pagan people, controlled their lands, but little did the people know that their cry and that their words of praise extended beyond their their own state of affairs, but to the deliverance of the whole world, which had been held captive to sin and darkness for far too long. This story ought to speak volumes to each and every one of us today. Because in it, we see our Savior and King in action. He traveled the road and he endured the journey for your sake and mine, for your salvation and mine. And like those first disciples, we too are to, the tra- we too are to travel the road that Jesus travels. To be by his side, to go where he goes, even when we don't know where that might lead us. We must trust that our Jesus has everything in hand. Another way of saying this is that although you and I may know the road that we are on for life, Jesus knows the journey and he knows the outcome. In one sense, the journey that we are on in this life is his journey. You see, as we surrender ourselves to God's will and the ways of our master, of Jesus, It is his journey that begins to fill our hearts. It's his kingdom that now lives in us. And he helps us to navigate the road of life that we find ourselves on. You see, or you know I should say, there are too many people in this world who think that life revolves around them. They think that they are the center of the known universe. It's my life. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do. The teenager screams at her parents. I'm bored with you and this marriage. I've had enough. I'm leaving. I want to do my own thing. The husband yells at his distraught wife. We often forget that our lives are not just about ourselves. Our lives have to do with others. 
with our families, our spouses, our children, our parents, our friends, co-workers, acquaintances, neighbors. No one's life is all about them. Being selfish and self-centered is part of the sinful human condition. And it can so easily turn us in on ourselves and turn us from each other and from the truth. But the truth is that my life is not just about me. It's about Jesus Christ. Your life is not just about you. It's about the one who died for you. It's about what he will do in your life and for your life and through your life. Now, we're often the main characters in the life that God has given us. But let's face it, what is your life? What is mine? As sinners who were once condemned to hell, we had thrown our lives away. But Christ redeemed us, each and every one of us. He brought us back. As the Scriptures say, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. The life that you live right now, Jesus paid for it. He paid for its sins and he earned its blessings. And that right there is a perspective that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds always. It helps us to keep things in perspective of who we really are in this world. You see, at the heart of, the, of Palm Sunday is a path. It's a road. It's the way our humble Savior journeyed as he went on to suffer and die for our sins. Palm Sunday is a very graphic way that depicts the path that Christ ultimately and humbly took so that he could enter our hearts today. Remember this. The road that you are on right now, the life that you are living, the journey that you are taking, it's not just about you. It is about Christ Jesus and his salvation. Our lives are to be about his kingdom, about his reign and his rule in our hearts and in the hearts of others. And so where does that leave us to this where does that lead us to this morning? Ask yourself, how can I respond to this particular story, to this Palm Sunday story? How does Jesus' entry into Jerusalem personally affect me in the here and now? And how can this story deepen my commitment to Christ? I would invite you in these next few moments to worshipfully reread this uh, Palm Sunday account and ask God through prayer prayer to translate its truth into your life. Perhaps this morning your heart's Your hearts are full of gratitude for the lengths to which Jesus has expressed his love for you. Why not take this opportunity to thank him and to praise him for all that he's done and that he continues to do? But not just here in these moments. Make that a deliberate part of who you are every day of your life. Like those first disciples, make the choice to stand united with Jesus as he unfolds the bigger picture of the journey that your life is to take. Picture yourself standing side by side with him as you journey down the road of life. Come what may, may you hold fast to Christ and may you trust him for all things, all things that come your way. Maybe for some of you this morning, as you consider the journey that you are on with Jesus, you acknowledge that there is an area of your life that still needs to come under his lordship an area where you are still living for self, an area that you don't trust Jesus for. Perhaps it has to do with your health or your finances, your need for love and companionship. Maybe it has to do with your job, your family, your fears. What are we to do with those things? Scripture encourages us to cast all our anxiety and our fears and our worries on Jesus. Why? Because he cares for you. 
he cares for you. So may you be moved to confess to Christ what bothers you. Open up to him. Be real with him. He wants that trans transparent you. And then repent to turn from those things that bothers you and ask him to empower you to live a, live a life that is completely surrendered to his will so that you may enjoy the freedom that Christ brings. Maybe as I've been speaking, you've had thoughts come to mind about the choices that you've made in the past or in even making right now. Choices that reflect the roads that you are traveling or have traveled or you are presently traveling down. Decisions that have hurt not only you, but others as well. Choices that show that you have actually left Jesus on the side of the road. Choices that you've never confessed or repented of, things that you've been holding on to, that you've begun to allow to dictate who you are and your value in this world. Poor decisions involving family, your marriage, how you've handled money and things, giving into crippling habits and addictions involving drugs, alcohol, pornography, gambling, sex. No matter what we have done, the opportunity to be free from the hold of sin is yours in Christ. But it takes for you to want to be free. Jesus has already given you the key. You've got to go through the door. That's the road that you need to travel. And that's the road that Christ is traveling on. Therefore, will you, will you walk with him? and take on his ways? Will you allow him to help you be triumphant over the things that are pulling you down? Will you not go another step on the road that you are on without relying on him? Really relying on him. I ask you to consider this as we come to the Lord's table and to reflect and give thanks for all that Jesus has done. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is the road that Jesus took for you and me. And it is the road that leads to salvation and freedom and victory for us. And so as you partake in the elements this morning, May it cause you to ascribe praise and thanksgiving to God for all that he has done through his son. May it also be an opportunity for you to personally share with him what might be causing you to stumble on the road of life that you are on and ask him for his intervention. He so wants to help you. You're not in this thing called life alone. And so would you prayerfully now, please come forward and take the communion elements that are up here or at the back, return to your seats and spend some time in prayer with God. And then after this time, I will close this segment off before we come to our final worship song for today. So please come forward and partake of the elements. Thank you.